If I had to describe GCF in one word, it would be caring. It's authentic. It's family. Community. GCF in one word. Family. Fun. Belonging. Community. Community. Home. Gracious. Resurrection. Family. GCF is the best family. GCF to me is home. Uh, if you have your Bible, you'll want, if you have a paper Bible, you'll want to find two passages and maybe keep your fingers there. We're going to look first around Isaiah 9-1, and then in just a little bit around Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, uh, Dan and Beth Ann and Micah and Anna read those for us earlier when we lit the Advent candles. Um, if you, uh, you can also find those on version, and I think we got the, the passages for this morning we did put into version. so if you want to click under events, you'll find the passages for this morning already there. Let's, um, let's take some time to pray. Jesus, just after watching three more of those videos, <laughs> I just want to take a minute to say how awesome it is that you are real and that you are alive and that you are at work in this world. It's sometimes so easy for us to be bombarded by darkness and covered up in darkness that we lose sight of the hundreds of thousands, if not millions and billions and gazillions of ways that you are at work every day all over this earth. And so we give you thanks and praise, Lord Jesus, for your love for us, for your steadfastness to us, for your faithfulness to us, for your grace shown to us, for each and every little thing and big thing you have done to bring us to this point and this place in our lives. I want to ask you in this moment, Lord Jesus, to work as you have worked so many times before. Right now, Jesus, as we talk about your word, dig into us. Dig deep. Dig deep. Leave no stone unturned in us. Leave no place untouched in us. And we say, Lord Jesus, in the power of your Holy Spirit, have every last bit of us that there is to have. We want you in this place this morning, Lord Jesus, to have it all. Because we trust that you can make more of it than we can possibly ever make of ourselves. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. On August 6th of 2007, seismologists at the University of Utah picked up what appeared to be an earthquake at 4.0 on the Richter scale centering out of Emory County, Utah. They called the sheriff's office in Emory County, Utah to find out what was going on out there. And the sheriff's office said, we felt the ground shake, but we don't have the same kind of damage we might expect from an earthquake. And they went out to try to find out what was going on. And a few minutes, a bit later, they called the seismologist at the University of Utah back and they said, we didn't have an earthquake. But out at the Crandall Canyon coal mine, uh, there was a collapse, and the collapse of the mine was so tremendous in this shaft that it it caused a middling-sized earthquake to register at the University of Utah. And on the other side of that mine collapse, three coal miners were trapped. It took rescue teams 10 days to come within a few hundred feet. They were 1,500 feet deep in the mountain. It took rescue workers about 10 days to finally come within a few hundred feet of where these miners were trapped. And when they came within a few hundred feet of where the miners were trapped, the walls of the mine and the ceiling of the mine shaft began to shake and quake again. And there was another collapse, and it killed three of the rescue workers. And at that point, the mine rescue workers, the people with the the federal government, the people with the state government, the governor of Utah, they all decided at that point that they would have to call off the search for these miners. And so they declared the miners lost forever in the deep, deep darkness of that mine. And still to this day, the bodies of those six miners have never been recovered. They're still lost somewhere in the darkness. You know... There is a darkness 
so deep that there is nothing any of us can do to get ourselves out of it. There is a darkness that is so deep that there is nothing any of us can do to get ourselves out of it. I think about that in light of a couple of things that have been said here at GCF over the last couple of Sundays. I don't know if it, if, if it caught your attention, but a couple of Sundays ago, we had a woman here in our congregation who came up to share a word on that Sunday where we, where all we did was worship and we shared some prophetic words. And she shared that she felt like there was someone here who was struggling with suicidal tendencies. Suicidal ideation and the Lord wanted to move in that. And if you knew anything about the woman who shared that, you know that she was at one time trapped in the deep, deep darkness of suicide. And it seemed to her as if there was no one who could possibly get her out of that deep darkness. And she knew that she was certainly incapable of getting herself out of it. Then last Sunday, how glorious it was in one of our baptism testimonies to hear a very young woman say to us, I was trapped in suicidal thought and suicidal ideation. And she shared with us a bit what it was like to live a life where you're trapped in a darkness so deep that you can't get yourself out of it. And it seems like no one can reach you in the midst of that darkness. There is a darkness that is so deep that we cannot get ourselves out of it, and other people cannot get us out of it. In a culture like ours that focuses so much on self-confidence and education and accomplishment and our pull-yourself-up-by-your-own-bootstraps mentality, it is important for all of us especially those of us who follow Jesus, to always remember that there is a darkness so deep that we cannot get ourselves out of it, nor can other people reach us in the midst of that darkness. Now Isaiah is one of the prophets to the nation of Israel about 2,700 years ago. And Isaiah wrote to the people of Israel at a time when the situation was very, very dark for them. They were on the verge of being taken over by larger nations, military powers. And when those nations finally did take over the nation of Israel, it was a dark, dark time. They murdered tens of thousands of people. They leveled the cities. They destroyed the temple. They hauled hundreds of thousands of people off into captivity in a foreign land. It was a dark dark time. And Isaiah writes to the people of Israel to say to the people of Israel, guys, you have gotten yourselves into a darkness so deep you can't get yourselves out of it. Now, the important thing that Isaiah is going to say to them is that they've landed in this darkness in part because it's their fault. It didn't just happen to them. In large measure, they got themselves into this darkness that they cannot get themselves out of. Isaiah says this, When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? It's a great verse. But Isaiah is basically saying the reason you landed in this darkness is because you chose to dabble in the darkness. You chose to consult what would have been then our modern day version of palm readers and astrologers and horoscopes. They decided to consult that instead of paying attention to God. And Isaiah will say this to them. Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. What does he mean testimony of warning? He's like, guys, if you pay attention to what God has been telling you through the prophets, we have all been warning you that darkness is coming because you're not paying attention to God, because you're not taking his instruction. Pay attention to how we're telling you darkness is coming. You're getting yourselves into a mess so that you can still follow God's instruction and get out of this. The people never listen to God. So Isaiah says they land in this situation. They have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged. And looking upward will curse their king and their God. They're going to land in a place where the darkness is so deep that when they look to the future, they see no hope. 
They look to the future and see no light on the horizon. They're going to land in a place where the darkness is so deep that they look up to God and it seems to them that God has no desire or interest left in them or in rescuing them. And then he says they're going to look around them and they will see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into outer darkness. Isaiah is saying, man, You guys have gotten yourselves into a darkness so deep you can't get yourselves out of it. As a matter of fact, the only way you can get out of this darkness is if God decides to get you out of the darkness. This darkness is so deep that only God can do something to get you out of it. And he's going to go on to talk to them about what's going to happen when God gets them out of this darkness. He says... The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. He's using past tense language here, but he's talking about what it's going to be like in the future when God finally moves them out of their darkness. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And he's going to go on to say, hey, when this light dawns in the midst of the darkness that you've gotten yourselves into, God is going to enlarge the land. You're going to be restored to your homeland from all of this captivity and foreign land. God is going to enlarge the land. And when you get in the land, it is going to be like the biggest, most massive harvest festival you have ever had. That is the kind of joy and rejoicing it's going to be. He says, you're going to rejoice like a bunch of soldiers rejoice when they find a lot of plunder after they've won a battle. It's going to be one long, continuous celebration when the light finally shines into the darkness. And he says, when the light finally shines into the darkness, you are going to destroy everything that reminds you of the darkness. You're going to destroy everything that reminds you of the warfare and the bloodshed that you have been involved in. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. They're all going to have a massive celebration tossing all the stuff of war, the instruments of war, and the damage that's been done to them into the fire. Just dancing around, celebrating because of all that the Lord has done. Now when is, when is God going to do this? Even more than, when is God going to do this? How is God going to shine this light? I mean, is it going to be like some bright light that comes floating down out of the sky? No. Isaiah says this. He he says that on that day, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. He's talking to God. You have shattered the yoke that burdens them. The bar, and get this, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors will be broken And it will be broken. And then look what else he says. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. The light is going to dawn on a day when God sends a new king. And when the new king comes, the rod of the oppressors, what they have held on their shoulders and the burden they have carried on their shoulders under this darkness that they've been in, that will be broken and it will be broken because the government is going to be placed on the shoulders of this new king. So that they will have a new king who can guide them out of the darkness. And who breaks the darkness. And Isaiah will go on to say that this new king, he's, he's going to be like David. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And Isaiah's like, you know, we've had a bunch of rotten kings. We have had a bunch of rotten kings. They've messed up and they've messed up and they've messed up. He'd be like, we can't count on one hand the number of decent kings we've had. You might get three. David being one of them. But when this new king comes, who's going to carry the government upon his shoulders and break the burden that's on the shoulders of the people, he's gonna, he is going to reign like King David, the greatest of the kings, even be better than David. He's going to reign with justice and righteousness. All will be well, and he is going to reign forever. There will be no more bad king, bad king, bad king. Oh, good king for a while. Bad king, bad king, bad king. Oh, a good one for a while. This king will reign forever. And then he says when this king comes, there are going to be certain royal titles that are given to this new king. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's how it's going to happen. There's going to be a new king that comes. When is it going to happen? Well, if we'd asked Isaiah, writing seven or eight hundred years before Jesus is born, if we'd asked Isaiah, when is this new king going to come, he probably would have speculated that it was going to be 20, 50, 100 years at a max probably. 
that this new king was going to arrive. That's what Isaiah would have said. But the followers of Jesus looked back on the life of Jesus, and they looked back on Isaiah's prophecy, and they said, no, that didn't happen 50, 100 years after Isaiah wrote. It happened seven or 800 years after Isaiah wrote in the life of Jesus. Notice Isaiah stresses, for, for unto us a child is born. In a passage just before he says that, he says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Isaiah, when he wrote that, probably thought virgin in Hebrew can also be the word for young woman. To Isaiah, it probably meant a young woman is going to have a baby. And that's going to be a sign that the new king is coming. But the the followers of Jesus look back on it and they go, oh, it wasn't just a young woman. It was actually a virgin who had never had intercourse. And she got pregnant, a baby conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit. Her name was Mary. The baby's name was Jesus. Oh, when did this happen? This happened in Jesus. And if it wasn't enough that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a woman who had never had sexual intercourse, well, then he died and was raised from the dead. And that sort of sealed the deal for them. And they looked back at this and they went, well, we probably know Isaiah thought it was going to be 50, 100 years in his lifetime. But looking back on it now, we can see that when Isaiah wrote about this king who would have these four new royal titles, who would reign forever in justice and righteousness, who would break the oppression, the darkness that's over us and bring us into the light, that can be no one else but Jesus. And so Jesus shall be called wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so this Sunday and the next three Sundays, we're going to look at these four terms. And how, they, how they're fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Wonderful Counselor. When the ancient world, 2,700 years ago, except that there were no mental health professionals who made money for counseling, a counselor was pretty much the same thing as it is today. If you take the mental health counselor role out of a counselor, is somebody who gives really good advice. Counselor is someone who, when you're in trouble, they can give you some advice that will help you get out of the trouble. A counselor is someone who, when you're in darkness, can help you find your way out of the darkness. What a counselor is today is what a counselor was 2,700 years ago. Just gives you good, solid advice, helps you get out of your problems, see your way through them. What about wonderful? Well, this word wonderful in the Hebrew Bible, 99% of the time is used to refer to God himself. And it refers to the sense in which God is sort of supernatural. He exceeds all things that are earthly. He is not bound by things that are earthly. So this word wonderful means that this counselor will have supernatural counsel. In other words, this new king that we believe is Jesus, that God is going to send, will counsel and advise people with nothing less than the wisdom of God himself. So that when Jesus speaks, he will speak to each and every person with nothing less than the wisdom of God and the counsel of God. And that's a good thing. Because God's point of view is bigger and better than everybody else's point of view. So when you need help getting out of your darkness and you need counsel getting out of your trouble, who better to guide you or counsel you out of your darkness or your trouble than Jesus who is helping you see things from the very perspective of God himself and giving you counsel that is directly counsel from God. So Jesus is wonderful counselor. And there was once a young man who was trapped in darkness that that came to Jesus for counsel. And when he came to Jesus for counsel, he threw himself at Jesus' feet. And this is what he said to Jesus. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now I have to say, as somebody who's trained as a counselor, the next thing Jesus says makes him sound like the worst counselor that ever walked the face of the earth. Because the next thing that he says is actually kind of harsh and snarky. So the guy says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says this, well, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Today they would teach you in counseling, that's not how you build rapport with the client. It makes Jesus sound like a really rotten counselor. But in reality, Jesus here is seeing something deep, deep, deep in this man. 
He's seeing something with the supernatural ability of God. He's seeing things that only a wonderful counselor could see that many of us who are counselors would miss in an initial interaction. It might take us three, four, five sessions to find it out or more. And Jesus sees it immediately because when the young man calls Jesus good, in part, he means it as a a genuine compliment. I mean, why else would you throw yourself down at the feet of a teacher unless you thought he was a really good teacher? But on the flip side of that, in the ancient world, when you called someone good teacher, it was believed that to be polite, you had to reciprocate or return the favor by calling the other person something equally good. So when the man calls Jesus good teacher, he's looking for Jesus to say good young man. You're a good young man. And therein is the man's darkness. Because he's living his whole life trying to be good enough to be assured that he can be saved. He's living his whole life trying to be good enough to know inside of himself that he is saved and he will have eternal life from God. But he can't quite get his mind wrapped around that. He can't quite believe it. So he's living his life in the darkness of wondering, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Am I good enough? And so he throws himself down at the feet of Jesus, hoping that Jesus will say, oh, young man, you are good enough. You are good enough. But Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And this is what makes Jesus a wonderful counselor because he goes straight after the darkness. He doesn't pet him on the head and say, oh, you're a good little guy. You're a good young man. He says, we have a fundamental problem from the get-go here. You think this is about you being good enough. And I'm here to tell you it's not about you being good enough for you, for God. It's about God being good enough for you. Whether or not you're saved or you have eternal life is not about how good and how well you behave and how well you do. It's about who God is. It's all about God's goodness and God's desire to save and God's ability to save and God's grace to save you. And then Jesus quotes a few of the Ten Commandments. Kind of picks them randomly from the latter section of the Ten Commandments. And when Jesus repeats some of the Ten Commandments, the young man says this, Teacher, All these I have kept since I was a boy. Excuse me. Teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, at this point, the the, the guy's really excited. Because Jesus just listed some of the commandments, and he's thinking to himself, and he's being quite authentic about this. He's thinking to himself, I've done those. Like, since I was a little boy, I have done those. Some of you who were raised in church can identify with that. Like, since I was little, I've done them. And the guy's really excited because he thinks Jesus is just right on the verge of saying, oh, you're good enough. You're good enough. You're in. But Jesus is a wonderful counselor, and he's not going to leave this guy stuck in any darkness. None at all. And so Jesus, we read, looked at him and loved him. I just want to take a pause right here to say something that wasn't in the manuscript, but I think is really important. Manuscript being the write-up of the sermon. There is no degree of inadequacy that you bring to the table with Jesus. There is no degree of ignorance that you bring to a setting with Jesus. There's no degree of wrongdoing or sin that you bring into a setting with Jesus where He doesn't love you. And precisely because he loves you, he will not say, oh, it's all okay. Precisely because he loves you, he will tell you exactly what you need to hear to get out of the dark. And so Jesus does. And he says, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Mm. Jesus is saying, hey, it's not about how good you are. It's about how good God is. And it's not only about how good God is. It's about how good God has been to send me. So that what matters now about whether or not you inherit eternal salvation is not how good you are, but whether or not you recognize how good God is in sending me. Jesus is saying, this is now all about me. 
Again, it's not what a great counselor would say. But Jesus is a wonderful counselor. And he wants this guy out of the dark and he says to get out of the dark, this is all now about what you say about who I am and how you respond to what you say about who I am. And if you say I am good teacher, if you have any inkling that I am the Messiah, the King that God has sent, you must say it and then respond to it by giving up anything that's part and parcel of the darkness. For him it was his wealth. And come and follow me. Jesus wants him out of the dark, so Jesus tells him how to get out of the dark. Give it all up. Give up everything that's keeping you in the dark and come follow me. Come after me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. The most wonderful counsel he could possibly have been given. And he can't take it because he likes some of the darkness more than he wants the light. If you want to get out of the dark, Listen to Jesus. If you want to get out of the dark, listen to Jesus. There is some darkness from which you cannot get yourself out of. From which the rest of us, no matter how much we try to help, cannot get you out of it. But Jesus can always get people out of the dark. So if you want to get out of the dark, listen to Jesus. Now there's one problem with this. Jesus almost always advises us to give up something that will otherwise keep us in the dark. If you listen to Jesus, He will give you counsel. But His counsel will almost always be advising you to give up something that will otherwise keep you in the dark. Just a couple of examples. If you've got a problem with pornography or sexual addiction, Jesus will give you counsel, but the counsel He will give you is likely to sound something like this. You have to stop being proud and hiding on it, and you have to ask somebody for help. See? Jesus is not just saying, it's okay, it's okay. He's saying, if you went out of the dark, here's what you do. Let go of the darkness of pride, the fear of what other people will think, and ask someone for help. See, Jesus, when He gives advice, is almost always advising us to give up something that will otherwise keep us in the dark. It's important for us to remember with Christmas, right here, the darkness of materialism. So many families will go deep, deep, deeper into debt just to have some kind of Christmas that a magazine picture or a commercial on television or a commercial online tells them they ought to have. And if you ask Jesus for advice about that, Jesus is probably going to say, give up the materialism. Give up the belief that more stuff will make your heart whole. Give it up. And follow me. See what Jesus is doing? He's given wonderful counsel But whenever he gives wonderful counsel, it will almost always call you to give something up. And here's the thing, guys. Even when Jesus is giving you comfort, even when his counsel comes in the form of comfort, he will almost always be calling you to give something up. Hard thing about Jesus. You know, a couple of weeks ago, a Saturday night, I couldn't sleep. I was worried about a ton of things. Excuse me again. Couldn't sleep. I was worried about a ton of things. I tossed and turned a little bit in bed. And finally I turned over and and snuggled up to try to get comfortable. I just said, Jesus, boy, I, I need some help. And immediately, immediately I felt what seemed to me to be a physical touch on my right shoulder blade. There was nobody behind me. I'd gone to bed before Kira felt what seemed to be a a physical touch on my right shoulder blade. And then I heard in my heart the words, Jason, it will be okay. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, 
That's advice from Jesus. Fifteen minutes later, like, oh, I have to figure this out. I have to solve these problems. What do I do? And then I, I had the distinct sense that Jesus said to my heart, let it go. The trying to fix it, the trying to solve it, is part and parcel of the darkness. Let it go. Let it be okay because I told you it will be okay. And it was. But you see, even when Jesus gives comfort, He's calling you to give something up that's part and parcel of the darkness. Why? Because He loves us. He doesn't want us in the darkness. And He can get us out of the darkness. And when the darkness gets so, so deep, He's the only one who can get us out of the darkness. Three years after the collapse at the Crandall Canyon mine, uh, there was a mine collapse in Chile that many of us will remember because the news covered that one like mad for months on end. It was at a, 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 a copper and gold mine. It was called the San Jose Mine. And there were 33 miners, one of the deepest mines on earth. There were 33 miners trapped at about 720 meters down in that mine. And when they began trying to figure out how to, and this is different, most of our, so many of our mines in the United States go into the side of a mountain. And most of the mines in Chile go deep, deep down into the ground. Not deep this way, but deep this way. And it made it significantly complicated to try to figure out how to get those 33 miners out of the rescue uh, shelter they were in underground. And they decided that they would, they would try three, three options. Option A, option B, and option C. And option A was to drill a hole in the ground. I'm going to make sure I get the names right. Was to drill a hole in the ground, one, start drilling one hole in the ground using a Strata 950 which was built by an Australian firm and owned, it was a drill, and owned by um, a South African mining firm. They shipped it across the ocean to Chile uh, so that they could start drilling down with the Strata 950. Option B was a SRAM T-130, which was actually built in Westchester, Pennsylvania by a company up there and owned by a mining company in Pennsylvania. And they shipped it to Chile to start drilling down. And the other one was a, a rig, I believe, called a Rig 421, uh, which was a Canadian design drill used in Canada, and it was shipped down as well. And they began three different these are three different types of drills. They began drilling three different types of holes. And the the um, the first one that that Plan A drill, which was the um, Strata 950, got down to about 320 meters. And when it got down to about 320 meters, the walls of the hole above it began to collapse in. And they were never able to get it below 320 meters. Then that rig 421, they put down into the ground. But the problem with the rig 421 was that it kept drilling off plumb. Which meant it would drill a little bit this way and then shift this way. And then shift back this way. Which would make it impossible to get a rescue capsule down. So it tapped out, I think, at around 550 meters. Which is when they finally gave up on it. And then there was the SRAM, T-130 which finally, at 630 meters, and you can see it on the little chart there, at 630 meters came through the roof, not of the rescue chamber the miners were in, but of a rescue chamber a little bit higher in the mine than where they were. Now here's the, the darndest thing about those miners. When the rescue pod finally came through, none of them said, oh, well, we're going to wait for the rig 421 to get through because the rescue capsule it can put down here is about six inches bigger around than the little 18-inch one that the SRAM got down here. I mean, you know, this is pretty daunting when you think you're going to take a ride in a little pod of 18 inches up through 3,000 feet of ground that may fall on you at any moment or you may get stuck. You know, like, they didn't say, oh, we'll, we'll wait, we'll wait for that one to, to get down here. They didn't say, oh, we'll wait for the rig 421 because it's supposed to hit a rescue chamber that's not as far down and we won't have as far up to go. 
No, when the SRAM T-130 hit the roof of that rescue chamber and the word spread back to the rescue chamber they were in, they climbed out of the rescue chamber they were in, went up to the other one, and one by one, slowly over a period of several days, they got in that rescue chamber one by one, and they went slowly up the 3,000 feet until they reached the light. And no one said no to the rescue effort. No one said, no, I think there's a better option for being rescued. Why? Because if you want to get out of the dark, you take the one thing that can get you out of the dark. And the same thing is so true with Jesus. If you want to get out of the dark, listen to Jesus. What He tells you to do will require some risk. It will seem tentative. It will call you out of the comfort zone. But if you want to get out of the dark... Listen. Listen. Because there are some darknesses that only He can get you out of.